Hello, and welcome back to the Arise Bible Study and Fellowship. I am Pastor Stephen. We're so thankful that you have joined with us here as we continue our study uh, in our new series, Who I Am. And this is what we need to understand is, you know, we need to understand who God says we are, what the Word of God says that we are. We need to understand who we need to be on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we've been studying the last few weeks on that. We're going to continue uh, here with I am a righteous and holy ambassador. If you're taking notes, and we do encourage you to do that, um, take notes. I am a righteous and holy ambassador. If you're watching this by recording, welcome. If this is your first time joining with us in one of our Bible studies, welcome. We do have over 200 hours of Bible study. Uh, we've been doing this for over three years. And uh, so we, we went through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, God has blessed us to, to really go deep into his word. So we got a lot of different studies, but in this new series, you're right here at the beginning. So congratulations. Uh, make sure you go back. We have about two weeks, I think, that we've already done. Uh, so you can get episode one and two. I believe this is three. Yep, this is episode three. And um, and so we're going to get right into it. Um, these are the questions. If you're taking notes, like I said, I encourage you to have a notebook or a Word document so that you can write this down so that you can study to show yourself approved. Uh, that you need not be ashamed because you're rightfully divided in the word of truth, not just on Saturday morning, but every day, all seven days of the week until we meet again. Uh, there are a couple of questions that we're going to be answering today, and I want you to write this down and as we do the study. Just keep this in mind. Keep it in mind as we do the study. Why did Jesus have to die? This is what we want to look at today is why did Jesus have to die? And then why did he die for me? Why did he have to die? And why did he die for me? And then the next thing is, how do I know that God loves me? You know, sometimes we feel like we're alone and abandoned on our own and stuck where we are and no one's lifting us out and where is God? But how do I know that God loves me? And then the fourth question is, how can I show him that I love him? How can I show him that I love him? So, again, the questions are, why did Jesus have to die? Why did he die for me? How do I know God loves me? And how can I show him that I love him? We'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 if you want to go ahead and turn to your copy of God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, we'll start around verse 11. I'll bring that up as I always do on the screen so that you can have this for yourself. Let me pull this up here for those who don't have their Bible with them. Don't worry, I got you covered. Pastor Stephen got you covered. So let's go ahead and let me widen the screen a little bit so we can get that whole counsel of God right there. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. So we're going to be starting in, uh, in verse. Uh, we're, we're going to be, let me get to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We we'll start around verse 11. I am using the Bible Gateway app. You guys know I love the Bible Gateway app. Uh, and so we are God's ambassadors, right? So verse 11, we're in, um, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us so that you can answer those uh, who brag about having a, a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit, right? So verse 14, either, either way, Christ, Christ's love controls us. Either way, Christ loves and controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. Good God Almighty, thank God for that. Verse 15, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. A new life has begun. We're going to keep reading. We covered that and we covered a lot of that in our previous episode, but verse 18, and all of this is a gift from God. Say a gift from God. Oh, we love receiving gifts, but this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. 
So we are Christ's ambassadors. There you go. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And the key verse for today is, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, that we could be made right with God through Christ. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and highlight that. That's one you need to write out and put in your notes. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now, she that's the New Living Translation. And of course, I, I always share with you guys when we do the Bible study, we want to look at the parallel. We want to go ahead and parallel that. So let me bring up a translation that uh, gives, gives us a, a reference here. Let's go back down to verse 21. That's the King James Version. And look at the difference between these, the way this is written in the translation. For we have made, this is verse 21, for we have made him, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, if you look at both of these verses, you can see there's a difference here. The difference is in the part B. So that, look at, look over here, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So we are made right with God through Christ. All right, that's one way of saying that. But when you look at the King James, it says that we might be, and this is the second part here, part B of this verse, so that we might be the righteousness of God in him which is more than just being made right. It's, it's a transformation. And so we're made right because Christ died for us. And through his sacrifice, we are cleansed. Our sins have been atoned for. We have been redeemed, right? And restored back to God and made right with God. True, true. But because that happened, if you look at the King James, it says now we have been made the righteousness of God in him. We have been made the righteousness of God in him which means that this is the state that we are in. We have been made, it's made, it's something that's changed, right? God has made us, renewed us, changed us, transformed us. And because he has renewed us and saved us, we are now his righteousness. Uh, it is, we are God's righteousness in Christ, right? And this is the key, you know, when, when we pray and, and from an American perspective, when we pray, oftentimes when we finish our prayer, we say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. But what does that mean? That means that we, because we are in Jesus, we are doing it in his name. We are doing it in his name, by his authority and his power, ordained by God. And we are claiming, we are locking that thing in the spirit realm that it might manifest in the, in the earth. In Jesus' name, we're in agreement with Jesus because what we're doing is of him. Of him, for him, by him, we are doing God's will because we are God's righteousness. We're doing right, living right, thinking right, being right in Christ, right? And so, so we have to get this understanding of the fact that Jesus came to die for us that we might live for him. You know, I was talking with Michael, uh, I believe it was yesterday, I was talking with Michael and, or day before yesterday, and we were talking about the scripture that says that, he that seeks to save his life will lose it, but he that loses his life for my sake will gain it. So when we are baptized, the word of God says we are baptized into Christ. And we are raised in newness of life. And so we're baptized into Christ, meaning that in his resurrection, we have been resurrected because we are in him. And because we are in him, he is now working in us and through us doing God's will in the earth. And that's the power of God. Why did this happen? Let's go back. I want y'all to see this is so beautiful when you can look into God's word and see something, see something that he did. Check this out, verse 18. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself, how? Through Christ. Okay, who brought us back to God? God brought you back to Christ. Why? For himself. God wanted you back. Who am I? Who? I mean, this is the study, who I am. I am one who God wanted back, which means we were lost. You and I were lost. God wanted us, wanted us back. And because he's God, he worked it out according to his will through Christ and brought us back to himself. And look what it says. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. So just like he brought us back to himself through Christ, he wants to bring others back to himself through us back to him. 
And that's why you have to speak up. That's why you have to testify. That's why you have to stand as light in a dark and dying world and proclaim the glory of God, love of God. You know what? I'm going to tell you all something else. We're not here to judge sinning. I want you all to get this today. This is something that has been coming out more and more. God has not called us to judge sinners. Why? Because the sinners are his sheep. That, those are the, that's the mission field. Though all of them, they're in God's hands. We are not here to judge the sinners. We are here to love the sinner. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, which means that while sinners are sinners in the world, those who don't legitimately don't know Christ. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people who come to church, call themselves Christian, and are blatant open sin and unrepentant sin, and they're making a mockery of Christ because they're claiming themselves to be Christians, but everyone knows they're sinners. That's not who I'm talking about. Those are the people we deal with. We deal with that. Okay. We deal with those who are in the church who are sinning because they call themselves Christians. And we deal with those who are Christians as well, who are true followers of Christ, who are our true brothers and sisters in Christ, who will inherit the kingdom of heaven because they, they are going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We help each other. Iron sharpens iron. We challenge each other to live a more holy life, a more perfect life, being perfected by the Ruach HaKadosh, which is, which is the Holy Spirit. That's where we keep our focus is in our body, to strengthen the body. That's, what, that's where our focus is. But when it comes to the world, people who are out in the world who are wilding out and doing crazy stuff and Satan is using them, our job is to be like the prodigal father waiting and loving on them until they come to the knowledge of Christ and are ready to receive them. The word of God says, it is the goodness of God that leads the heart to repentance. Well, how are they going to see his goodness? They're going to see it through you. Well, what do you mean, Pastor Stephen? That means that prostitute. That means that, that, that fornicator. That means that liar, that thief, that brawler, that drunkard, that homosexual, that, that, that murderer that's out there in the world. When you love them, that love reveals that God is loving them. Look, it goes back, let's go back to the original, that it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? While they are yet in sin, we are dying for them by loving them in their mess, letting them know they don't have to stay there, that God has sent Jesus Christ to them, that they might be redeemed and that the, their lives might, um, might be restored. Some of them don't even know that they, have, they can get a second chance. They don't know that God, verse 18, and all of this is a gift. They don't know that God is giving them a gift. And that's a beautiful thing to tell a sinner. You know what? God loves you so much. He brought me to you today to let you know that he has a gift for you. What? God has a gift for me. Yeah, God has a gift for you. I don't know about you. Have you ever been blessed in your mess? Have you ever been in a place where you know you were wrong, but God still blessed you? That's the moment I'm talking about. And as you being the light representing Christ in the earth, representing God in the earth, you're going to speak the words of life over those who have a sentence of death on them. And when you do that, they're going to look up and see light. In you. They're going to see God in you. And that's why we are here. And when you let them know that God loves you so much, he has a gift for you. And, then, and they're going to ask you a gift. What kind of gift? And let them know that it's his love. And his love was sent through Christ. And Christ was delivering that package to them. And the devil was trying to get in the way. But God wants, and God has sent me today to remind you to open that gift. That gift is salvation through Christ. And this is the thing. A person who is in sin knows they're in sin. They know they're in darkness. They know they're in bondage. They know they're being tortured. They know they're being oppressed. They know they're demons in their life. They know they need help. A drowning person knows that they're drowning. So when we go out into this world and they're wilding out and they're cussing and they're acting mean and they're being crazy and they're being disrespectful and they're not treating us well, that's when we love them. It's hard to beat on people that's trying to hug you. It's hard to beat on someone that says, can I pray for you? The meanest person, if you let them know that God loves them, will break down and cry. Even a person in prison, male or female, the hardest person, when they truly come to understand that the father of all creation, the one that created them, is reaching out to them to do what? Look what it says. Now we're going to go back. Verse 18, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Why? Well, God was in Christ reconciling the world. That's everybody. Everybody that was born has been born. Everybody that's been born now and everybody that will be born. For God was in Christ re reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Good God Almighty. If that's, if that's a liberating scripture, 
You need to have that on your lips when you talk to people. Why? Because God, in order for you to be made, made, be made right with God, your sins have to be forgiven. And thank God we serve, we serve a forgiving God. He wants to forgive sin. Why? Because we were born in sin. We didn't sin. It wasn't our, our choice to sin. We inherited this from Adam and Eve. And it says, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation, right? So that's where today, as you look at who I am, I am the messenger of God. I am the ambassador of God. Why? Because God has sent me to those in my those who are in your circle, every I'm talking about the person who delivers packages to your house, the, the person at the grocery store, the person on your job. It could be anybody, anybody that you can see or hear their voice. God may speak to you and say, that's the one today. Go let them know I love them. Go let them know that you want to pray for them. Ask them, do they need prayer? Because, you know, most people do, especially in this world. Most people do need prayer. Why? Because look at this. We're going to keep going. We're going to go back over again. Verse 19. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. When you are in sin, you feel like you have a life sentence of death. And oftentimes sinners are looking for a way to get free, but their flesh is so strong. Their flesh is such so against them. And their history is condemning them. Their history is saying, this is who you were and this is who you are. It's never going to change. You can't do this. You're going to just keep sinning. But that's just who you are. And that's a lie. And those people feel like a lot of them feel like they listen to the devil and they feel like they can't be clean. I've sinned too much. I, I've been I've been in this too long that I can't be made right with God. It's impossible for God to clean me. And I'm telling you, God can no matter who you are, if you have breath in your body, God will forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That means he will forgive you for everything you've done. And he'll help your mind get renewed so that your life can be transformed so that that sin that would easily beset you will be cast off of you and no longer have power over you. You will have power over it through Christ. Hallelujah. Verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassador. That's authority. We talked about this last week. You need to Google ambassador. What is an ambassador? Google what power does an ambassador have. You need to look at what that means. There's a reason why this is in the word of God. God doesn't just put things in his word. If, if you want to hear his voice, you need to understand that this is his commands. This is the reality that he has built into the world he created. When he created you, he created you with a purpose. And your purpose was to represent him in the earth, right? To represent him in the earth and to become a representative that is an ambassador. You're not just a child of God. You're more than a child of God. You have authority because you are an ambassador of Christ. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak when we plead. Look what it says. Again, it's telling you the instruction. What do what, what is it? As an ambassador, what do I do? We speak for Christ when we plead what? Come back to God. Hmm. That's it. So simple. All we're asking people to do is come back to God. Just come back to God, which means that you were in God before. You can't come back to a place you've never been. And this will be a revelation to a lot of those people you're going to talk to. A lot of your family members, your cousins, your friends. When you tell them, look, God wants you to come back to him. And you need to let them know, did you hear what I said? Come back. That means that you were already in God. Well, what do you mean? We're going to, I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you what, what that means. You're going to see that in just a second. Come back to God. But God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for, for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now, I don't know if you've ever, uh, most of us have uh, lied, stolen, you know, we've done things wrong. Ha have you ever had someone take your place and punish you for the thing you did wrong? Imagine that. And that's what he's saying here is that the penalty for sin, the wages of sin is death. And everyone who sins is deserving of death. Why? Because that's the way God set it up from the beginning. In the garden, that was a, a, a law and principle in the garden. And the day that you eat thereof, that fruit that you're not supposed to touch, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. There's a, there's a penalty for disobedience and sin. Sin is simply not doing God's will. That's the easiest instruction. I mean, that's the easiest definition you can give of sin. Sin is simply not doing God's will. Well, how do I know what God's will is? Well, God's will is his word. Well, where, where is his word at? The entire Bible. And the Bible is not a book, by the way. You can put this in your notes. The Bible is not a book. The Bible is a library. It is 66 books 
of God's word being spoken. 66 books. So if you want to know God's will, you need to know God's word. And I'm thankful that you're here on the Ryan Bible study because that's what we get into. We get into our father's word because we want to walk according to his will. So the second part of that is so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's what it's all about. God is just saying, look, come back to me so I can help you become right. You, you can't do it on your own. If you could, then, you know, you, would, you wouldn't even need God. I remember when I first came to Christ, I came straight off the street. I mean, I was doing drugs. I was smoking reefer, marijuana. I was doing coke. I was getting drunk. I was out having sex. I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And when I came to church, I came for God. And that's the beautiful thing. When you, if you're going to bring someone into the kingdom, make sure they have that mentality. And you can correct that in your heart. I didn't come to join a group of people. That's not why I came. I didn't come to have a man or a woman stand before me and teach me God's word. That's not why I came. I came for God himself. And every person that I saw, whether they were in the choir or an usher or, or a minister or a Bible teacher, every person that I, I saw, I was looking for God in them. I never put not one person on the pedestal. No person. I'm not going to walk around talking about that's my pastor. That's my dirt. Never. I came for God himself. Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. I want to be restored back to him. And that's what it says, the second part, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now, every messenger of God, every person that speaks God's word, I'm thankful. I've been in Christ over 33 years. And I'm thankful that those who have walked up right before me show me the proper life and examples that I could follow. I'm thankful for that. And even those who have walked before me and have fallen uh, has shown me how to get back up. Even though they sinned, they 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 repented and got back right with God. I was thankful to see that example. And we also need to demonstrate that we're not perfect. We're being perfected. But in order to understand that, we're going to go to Ephesians. And I want, I want to make sure that you guys get this because the four questions that we have to answer, you already should have some answers, is why did Jesus have to die? And why did he die for me? He died so that you could become something. And he died because God's will was for him to die. But why was it God's will? And so that we already covered that. So make sure that you go back, watch this again and, and get that. Then the, the, the other question is, how do I know that God loves me? And how can I show him that I love him? Right. And so we're going to keep going. We're going to look at Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians chapter one. I won't keep you long today. Ephesians chapter one. And we're going to take a look at Paul. Paul is amazing. He's one of my favorite. Uh, he's actually not just a disciple. He's an apostle. Um, and um, And so we're going to. Look at verse one. Let's, let's go ahead and read that. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Let's stop right there. Let's stop right there. Let's make that sentence about you. When you talk to people, everything you say and do is written in heaven. It's a book in heaven. It's your name on it. And everything that you say and do is in your book. So everybody, even though there's 66 books in the Bible, every person that has ever been born has their own book, their own life story. And it's going to be uncovered, everything you have thought, said, and done. And so this, if you open up this chapter about you, and I'm going to put my name in there. This letter is from Stephen. I'm teaching y'all today, and this is part of my letter. It's written in heaven. This letter is from Stephen, chosen by the will of God to be a what? An ambassador of Christ Jesus. You see how that works? I, I hope you got the quickness. and I hope you felt that in the spirit. Ooh, because I felt that in my spirit. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Why? I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus. So in your city, you've been assigned to your city. And you've been assigned to communicate with the people in your city. And it, it can happen in a lot of different ways, whether you volunteer at your church or in your community. Any place you can go and speak, any place you can bring God's presence. It could be at when you go to lunch at a restaurant. If you are there, you have a waitress that's talking to you. Any person you communicate with, you can communicate God's love. Look what it says. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. You see who he's ministering to? I told you earlier about sinners. It's not about us judging sinners. Those are God's sheep. We are his children. God wants us to minister to each other, strengthen each other. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, who are what? Faithful followers of Christ Jesus. Why did he put faithful in there? Why did he put the word faithful in there? Think about it. Because there were those in Ephesus who weren't faithful, but called themselves followers of Christ Jesus. So he's writing to those who are pressing in, and, and, and pressing forward in God. Verse two, may God our Father, our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ, give you grace and peace. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Why is that? Why is that? For those who are new in Christ, may not understand 
what that means, because those are certainly Christian terms. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It says that by grace, listen to this, I'm going to say it slow, for by grace are we saved through faith, not of works that any man would boast. It is the gift of God. For by grace, God's unmerited favor, we didn't do anything to deserve being saved. By his desire, we were saved through what? Faith. Faith is what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Imagine this. You're on a deserted island. You've been there for like, let's just say three weeks, and it's just you, and you want to be saved. And you're running out of water. You're running out of food, and you're going to die if no one comes. It is God's grace. It's nothing you did at all to get yourself saved. It is God himself that reaches down from heaven and grabs you and sets you back into a place of peace. It is God who said, I am saving this one. This one is mine, and I'm saving this one. You will not die. You will live and glorify all the works of the Lord. Verse two, not only did you, um, it says give you, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace, continued unmerited favor, but also peace. Good God Almighty. I don't know about you, but peace is a beautiful thing. Peace is a beautiful thing. To be able to, in the midst of a storm, to be at peace. The wind blowing and thunder and lightning cracking and you got all that happening around you, but you are in perfect peace. Nothing is bothering you from the outside or the inside. That's when you walk on water. When you keep your mind stayed on him, the word of God says he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. That's what's important. We have to keep our mind stayed on the God that has that is the deliverer. We said this earlier that when uh, we need to not talk about how big our problems are, we need to talk about how big our God is. It doesn't matter what the problem is. God is always bigger. Verse three, let's look at your spiritual blessing and we're going to get to it. Verse three, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Stop. Come on now. This is, this is the stuff when on the rise, we slow down and we get. I want y'all to get this. this. This is telling you because you're an ambassador, what have you been equipped with? Let's look, take a look at it. He's giving glory to God, our praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? And I will take a moment here just to pause because God is what he is. God is what he is. His name was revealed. I am that I am. And they call it the Tetragrammaton. It's Yahweh. His name is revealed in the scripture. Jesus has revealed his name unto those who are the true followers of God. Check this out. God is what he is. Who he is is our father, Abba. Now, his name is Yahweh. He has many names, Elohim, Jehovah. There's a lot of names that, that are the scriptures for him. But Jesus is his son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is his son. People, there's some people out there, and it's a false doctrine that will teach that Jesus Christ is God. And when they say it like that, they're saying that Jesus Christ is the Father. Like, they're the same. There's no separation. And you, I want to make sure y'all understand here on the rise, that is a lie from the pit of hell because it's not even true. All praise to God, the Father of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God is telling us that God sent himself through his son. Yes, absolutely. God with us, right? Emmanuel, God with us. But God is what he is. Okay? Jesus Christ is Yeshua HaMashiach. He is Jesus the Messiah. He was with God. In the beginning, God created all things through him, and by him all things were created. Even in eternity, before time started, Christ was there. The word of God was there. Where's Jesus? And this is how you got to deal with these people that do this, because they want to tell you that Jesus Christ is God. So if there's a throne in heaven, it's Jesus Christ on that throne, and there's no other thrones. It's a lie, because we know that the word of God says that Jesus is seated where? On the right hand of his father. I just want to make that distinction, that in heaven, God is on the throne, and Jesus is on his right hand. That right hand is the hand of power. Jesus is beside his father. Okay, so just make sure we understand that separate in purpose. One in purpose, right? Because God's will, right? Yahweh, his will is going to be done, period. And the, his word is his will. So Jesus is in alignment with that. And then you have the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God in the earth. So I know that was a little side note, but I want to make sure every time I see this, I need to make it clear so that we understand that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right. 
uh, who was blessed. Um, just read it again. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now listen, listen what it says. Look at the verb tense, who has blessed. That's all past tense. That means there's nothing you need in the future. It's already been given to you. Okay, Pastor Stephen, what's been given to me? He's given us, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. You know, a pastor once said, when it says all, what does it mean? It means all. When it says every, it means every. The question is, do you know what spiritual blessings are yours? Do you know how to operate as an ambassador in the spiritual blessings that have already been given? Look what it says, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are where? We are united with Christ. That's why we are in Christ, because in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It is in Christ that we have this inheritance. We're joint heirs with Christ, and we are in Christ because we're united with Christ. And the blessings we have are our spiritual blessings. Where are they? In heavenly places. Now, look, when you pray, and Jesus modeled this prayer, your will be done on earth as it will be in heaven. Is that what he said? No, as it already is. Get this. God has decreed his will in the earth before the earth was made. I'm saying it again. You write this down. God has decreed his will in the earth before the earth was made. God in heaven decreed it would be so. Now, I'm going to show you something. Let's keep going. We're going to get to this so you can see the spiritual and the physical and how it operates. These things are already done in the spirit. They're manifesting in the physical, but already done in the spirit. You need to walk in the spirit. For those that walk in the spirit of God, he gave power to become the what? Sons of God. You need to walk more in the spirit than in the flesh. You need to think more in the spirit than in the flesh. Verse four, even before, look what he says, he made the world, even before he made the word, world, verse four, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Good God almighty. See, this is, this is the, the glory of God. I want y'all to see. I want y'all to see this. We're going to highlight verse four and make sure you highlight it and you, you make some notes on this. Verse four, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stop right here. Look what he said. Even before he made the world, even before Genesis one, in the beginning, God created, right? E even before Genesis one, even before he made the world, God loved you and chose you in Christ. Okay, let's stop right there. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means before he even made the earth with all this dirt and water and sky and animals and humans and plants and all this stuff that's on the earth, before he even put his hands and his word to do that, in his mind, the holy, righteous mind of God, in eternity, he knew his plans. He knew what he was going to do. And he knew you were going to be made. Why? Because he had decreed it as so in, the, in, the, in heaven. Even before he made the world, God loved you. Look at this. Even before he birthed you into the earth, you are not a mistake. You are planned. Even before he made the world, God loved you and chose you. Now, let me tell you something about this thing about being born in this world. Be because most people think that you were born in this world because your mom and dad, you know, lay down and then you was born. No, that's not why that happened. They laid down because you needed to be born. Whether you were born, well, whether they were married or unmarried, doesn't matter. God brought you to the world when he brought you to the world through those two people because you needed to be born at that very moment to, to do his will in the earth. There's a reason why you're alive now rather than back in Jesus' day or even before Jesus' day. He wanted you to be alive now. And even before he made you, he loved you. He loved you in him. Look at this. You were in him and you would, look what it says. God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy. Someone, we were talking about this. We were talking about this when it comes to our children. And we were talking about the fact that the, if you look at what God is saying, God is saying that you were in him before he created you in the world. That same thing happens through us as human. My children were in me before I married my wife. Before we were intimate and she got pregnant, my children were in me, just like we were in God. And in time, God brought us into the world through our parents when it was time for that to happen. But before that happened, think about this. You were in God. Well, Pastor Stephen, why do you keep harping on the fact that we were in God? Okay, we were in God. What does that mean? Well, let's go back to 2 Corinthians because we talked about it. Look at this. 
we're going to go back to verse uh, verse 18. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. That's why. Remember I said, in order to go back to something, you had to be there originally. In order to go back to God, you had to be with him originally. Well, how do we know that we were with God originally? Because it says it in Ephesians. It says it right here in Ephesians chapter 1. It says that we were in God, verse 4, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. That's why he loves us. He loves us so much. He ordained that we would be what? Holy and without fault in his eyes. The only way that you could be holy or without fault is for you to be redeemed. And thank God that he redeemed us through Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 5. God decided in advance to adopt us. Oh, good God. Oh my. This is... I don't know about y'all, but this is blessing me. Because this is stuff, this nothing, we had nothing to do with this. We were just born into this world. But God, verse 5, decided in advance to adopt us into what? His own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Oh, man. I, boy, if we was at church, I might start running. <laughs> y'all, this is blessing me. Why? Because look what it says. This is in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. God said, I am going to create this. When I create it, Adam and Eve are going to sin. And when they sin, every person born after them, every human being born after them will be born in sin. And if I don't get them out of that garden, they're going to forever be in sin. So we're going to get them out of that garden. And every person born from Adam to when Christ returns, I am going to redeem them. And I know them, they're in me, and I'm going to send them into the world. And God says, beforehand, he says, and I'm going to adopt them. Why? Because I'm going to send you. And the word of God, Jesus, Yeshua, I'm a Shiach, said, I will go. And God sent him, and he said, go get my children. And Jesus hit this earth as a baby, and from that point forward, he grew in favor with God and man. One mission is to seek and save those who are lost. And he's still seeking and saving those who are lost today. And he's doing that through us. Why? Keep going. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. Look at that. God said, look, in the garden where the enemy thought he won. And he was like, in order to stop this, this planet from being filled, because, you know, we're, God made us in his image and after his likeness. In the Latin, it's called Imago Dei. And then the Satan was like, you know what? If I can't be God, then I'm going to make sure that everybody who was made in his image and after his likeness, they worship me. And that's what he attempted to do in the garden. He said, if I can get to the original two, then everybody else after them will have to bow down and worship me. They're going to be in sin. Because they thought, that, the devil actually thought that the state that he was in, which was fallen, is unredeemable. The devil is fallen. Put that in your notes. The devil is fallen and unredeemable. And he thought, if I could get them to sin, they'll be fallen and unredeemable as well. Why? Because that had never happened. There was no redemption for sin in eternity. You're in the spirit. And in the spirit, there's truth. And the truth is, if you sin, you do that willingly and willfully. The angels have their own will. And so when the devil sinned and he caused one third of the angels to sin, the judgment fell and it was like, you're going to be destroyed for all the time. And he's like, you know what? Then if that's how you do, I'm going to destroy what you created. And they're going to be destroyed for all the time too. But he didn't know that God is all wise. And God, if God knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin, he already knew that the devil was going to do it. Think about this. Think about this. If God is omniscient, and he is, which means all power. And if Satan was in heaven talking about, I'm going to exalt, my, exalt myself above the throne of God because he wanted to become God, and that iniquity was found in his heart, and he convinced one third of the angels to fall, which means he had to communicate with them in heaven, by the way, and God is omniscient, which means he's everywhere at all times, and he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. If God is all the omnis, why did God allow Satan to do that? Think about it. If Satan is right there in his presence and where God is, where his throne is, if in heaven Satan did that and rebelled against God, why did God allow it? He allowed it because he's holy and righteous. He allowed it because he made the angels like us having their own free will. And he allowed each angel to decide for themselves what they wanted, just like he allows us to decide for ourselves what we want. And when they made the decision, he already knew what he was going to do. See, that's the thing about God. God is so patient. God is so long-suffering. He'll let you make some mistakes. He knows. He knows that you're going to do it, right? But he says that he will now count. He will not count your sin against you 
if you come to Christ. That's the redemption part. And so Jesus, when he came and God told, you know, the devil in the garden, he told Lucifer in the garden, he says, you know, through the woman who you have brought this to all mankind, I'm going to bring through her seed one that will crush your head. Your bruises heal, which means you're going to hurt his flesh, but he's going to crush and destroy your head, which means your government, this thing you're trying to set up on the earth, he's going to destroy that power that you're trying to create in this world. He's going to destroy that. Hold that in the garden. All right, so verse six, so we praise God. This is the question, are you doing that? Are you praising God? So we praise God for the glorious grace. We talked about grace. For the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Do you belong to yourself? Are you making your own decisions? Are you your own God? Are you, I do what I want. I think what I want. This is my, I make my choice. I do it. Because that's Satan. Jesus purchased you with his own blood. That's what redemption means. He is like the kinsman redeemer. He came and he said, you know what? I know that the wages of sin is death. And this person, speaking to you directly, that person deserves to die. I want to die for them. I'm going to die for them so that they can live for me. Jesus owns us. We belong to him. So we praise God, verse 6, for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. It wasn't like a little drop of water on you in that hot, hot desert. You're walking through this desert and you're hot and God just take a little drop of water and drop it on you. No, pour it out. That means a whole ocean full of water hits you. That's, that's how much grace he gave you. And now you're walking on the water and you ain't hot no more. Because Jesus has brought us with his, with his life. Verse 7, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sin. Mm. Good God Almighty. I know y'all understand that because that's easy to understand that the wages of sin is death. And the only way to be redeemed, because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So there's no remission of sin. And so Jesus came as the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, the lamb slain before the very foundation of the world. He came to give us freedom by what? Verse seven. He is so rich in kindness and grace. This is talking about God, our father. We call him Abba. So rich in kindness and grace that he purchased, he is purchased. There's, there's, there's an exchange. This is the way God set it up. There has to be an exchange, equal exchange. In fact, the sin that Adam caused in the garden to happen, at every point of falling according to God's will, had to be restored. It wasn't that they just ate the fruit and sin. It was so much more than that. And at every point where they sinned, there had to be someone that would come and equally sacrifice to cover each point that was broken. Jesus came, and the word of God says that Jesus is the second Adam. Did you know that? Jesus is the second Adam, right? He is the one who came to redeem us. He is the life-giving spirit that came to deliver us. Now, through flesh, the first Adam caused us to sin, but by the spirit, Jesus has come to deliver us. He is so rich for his stuff in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom. Have you ever been a slave? Did you know anybody that was a slave? Have you heard any stories of people that were slaves? This is, this is what it's talking about. When a person's a slave, they have no ability to free themselves. You're in bondage and oftentimes in chains. You ain't moving. And if you try to run, oftentimes the stories I've seen, they cut off your feet. So you can't run. They cut off your hands to teach you a lesson if you still like all of that kind of stuff. They were we were in sin, heading for death and destruction. And Satan was laughing the whole time. Every day we woke up in sin. He was like, you're one day closer to me and you're going to be with me being tortured for all eternity. Verse seven has given us the understanding. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Now, I have been one that have been arrested. I have been one that have been caught. I have been one that have been exposed. I have one that was being condemned. I have been in the court of law about to be sentenced. Do you understand what I'm saying? And if you haven't, then live through me and understand this. When you hear that judge judge in your favor, when you know you're in sin. And I'm going to tell you, and when I went to court, my brother was already in lockup. He ended up in Riker. I was right behind him. And when that judge called me in and he looked at me and this is what that man said to me, didn't know me from nothing. All he knew is that my brother was already in lockup. He had already had run-ins with my brother. And they put me in front of the same judge. That judge looked at me and it was nothing but the, the, 
the glorious grace of God himself. That judge looked at me. He says, Stephen, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to give you a second chance. He says, I, I have, I've never seen you in my court. I know you have never appeared before me. And I'm going to give you this one chance. I'm going to give you this one chance. I'm not going to send you to jail. But I tell you what, if I see you again, I'm going to do to you what I did to your brother. And that day when he gave me that grace, that glorious grace, I told myself, you will not appear in front of this judge again. No, sir. My brother ended up in Rikers in New York. And I was like, you know what? No, I'm, I'm straightening myself up. Why? Because look what verse 7 said is then. He purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. That was God in that courtroom. I was guilty. Not only that, but so much more that they didn't know. But they caught me for one thing. But I'm telling y'all what. In that courtroom, when I stood before that judge, he forgave me. When that sentence was lifted off of me, good God Almighty, I felt the glory of God. I knew that God had was fighting on my behalf. Verse 8, he has showered his kindness on us. Why? Because it says, along with all wisdom and understanding, he not only wants us to be free, he wants us to have wisdom and understanding. Why? Because we are his children. Remember? Adopted into his family. Verse 5. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family. He knew we were going to be in situations where we, our sin brought us to a place to be destroyed. But that's where he shows up in our life. And that's the message we take when we call people home to him, come back to God. Remember, that's the message that we saw, right, in 2 Corinthians verse 5, I mean, chapter 5. We're inviting people to come back to God. And when we do that, we're saying, look, God doesn't care what you've done. Sin is sin. All sin is sin. And sin is just being disobedient to God's will. And God says, look, no matter what you've done, I can forgive you. The word of God says where sin abounds, that means no matter how much sin is in a person's life, the Bible says that grace much more abounds. It has to. In order that if you got five feet of sin, you got to have at least five feet, one inch of grace to cover it. And that's what God is saying, that no matter how much you sin, no matter what you've done on this planet, God says he is able to forgive you for your sins, and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And that's the message. That's the good news. The good news is you don't have to stay in sin, no matter what you've done, no matter what you have experienced in your life, no matter what you did or no matter what happened to you, that God can cleanse you, purify you inside and out, restore you, and then give you his kindness and grace to walk with you the rest of your life. And you can be free to walk with the son of God because you belong to him. You are his. And verse 8, he has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Do you have that? Do you have wisdom and understanding? Yes, because he already did it. Look at the verb tense. He has showered, has showered. It's already done. We need to walk in the present understanding of our past blessings been given already. God has already given you as an ambassador his, his power. God has already given you as his child, verse uh, verse five, in advance, the adoption into his what? Family. You are adopted. In, you know, not just a Christian. You are a follower of Christ, a joint heir with Christ, an ambassador of Christ, a child of light given power to walk in the grace and the power that he's given you for your life so that he can give you the wisdom and the understanding, which is his word. Because, you know, people say knowledge is power. No, the application of knowledge is power. God wants you to walk in wisdom, which is the applied application of the knowledge that he's going to give you and understanding. It's not enough just to do it. You need to know why you're doing it. Why are you alive today? Why are you representing God in the earth? Why would you even ask people to come back to God? Why would you share the good news with others? Why? Because that's wisdom and the understanding is because he did that for you. Do not show up in heaven by yourself. You want to plant seeds, you want to water seeds so that God can give the increase. That's the key. That's the key today is that you want to make sure that as you do, as you're seeking out the truth and as you're looking at who I am. And we know that today we're looking at the righteousness that we're righteous and we're holy ambassadors before God. As you do that part, you want others to know they can be invited to do the same thing. If God saved you, he can do others. And just like he used others to draw you to himself, he'll use you to draw others. And what does that mean? That doesn't mean you just walk around with the Bible under your arm, speak in your hand and telling everybody to repent because the end is near and you're going to die and go to hell. That's not the love of God. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus came preaching the kingdom. He said, this kingdom 
will we preach into all of the world? What kingdom? The kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? That's the kingdom, what we just looked at, that he has made you to be righteous because the, Jesus who came, who had no sin, became sin and died for you, that you might live for him. Why? So that you can go out and invite others to come and live for him. Why? Because they're in sin and they don't even know that in the darkness they're in, all they need to do is turn on the light. It's just like being in the house. You don't need to stay in a room when, when you have electricity. You sit beside a lamp, turn the lamp on. You'll have the light. That's why you have to be the light. And the, and the way that you're the light is by demonstrating God's love to a hurting dying world. It's by when you go out having the, the love of God on you. And I would, I would say to you, don't go out without knowing who you are and who you are. I am an ambassador of God, a joint heir with Christ. I have been adopted into the family of God. I'm taking light into a dark world. I'm seeking and saving those who are lost, and I'm loving everyone that I see. And that way, when you go out, you're not going out as yourself. You're going out as Christ. Remember, because you're in Christ, and God was working his will in the earth through Christ. Now he's working his world, his way in the world through us who are in Christ. So as you go out, just understand this. Why did Jesus have to die for me? Because that was God's will. Why did he have to die? Because that was God's will. Why did he die for me? Because God had already preordained that you were going to be his and he wanted you back. How do I know that God loves me? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us because we were righteous. He died for us because we were sinners that were going to be made right through him. How can I show him that I love him? By doing exactly what he tells me to do. To go out and invite others to come in. To go out and love them to be friendly. You don't always have to go out with scriptures. You can just go out with doing good works. The Bible says that God, that the world will see your good works and glorify God in heaven. What's good works? It could be anything, anything that's right to do, do it. And sometimes people say, well, I just don't know what to do. I said this before, just do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing. And if you do that, that's demonstrating your love for God because you're representing him in the earth. If you want to know who God is, the Bible says God is love. God is love. And what does love do? Love covers a multitude of sin. Love does not go out and, and condemn people. Love comes out and says, look, I love you. I know you're dirty. Give me a hug. Stand up. I'm with you. Here's a kiss. Let me help get you clean. How can I help you? I'm here to love you. And that's what you do. And when you do that with people, whether you're only there for a season or just for one little reason, you'll be obedient. You plant a seed, which means you say what you need to say to glorify God. You do what you need to do that glorifies God. Someone will come behind you and water that seed in that person. And over time, as God draws them, as Jesus' name is lifted up, you draw them unto him. And then that person will give their life to Christ. And when you get to heaven, and when you stand before our Heavenly Father, you will actually hear, well done. What did you do? Well done means you did something. Well done. What did you do? You were good and faithful. Good and faithful to what? To do his word. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Into thou in into the joy of the Lord. That's what we want to hear, but we need to do it on a daily basis. And each day, we need to do more and more. Instead of hating people and being mean and mad and angry, love people. They are hurting. People who attack you, people who are mean to you, they're just hurting. In fact, we used to be like that. Cussing and being mean and driving all crazy on the road and just being mean. We were like that. A lot of us were like that. So we're not condemning them. We're loving them. We're, we're letting people in while we drive that want to get into the lane. You know, nobody let us in, but you know what? We will, we will let them in, right? We're going to be nice to people that, that are hurting. And if you see somebody that's hurting, like I was talking to my wife last week, we were at the grocery store and, and when, when I drove up, I saw the gentleman uh, sitting on the curb and, and I could tell he was in distress. And so we went to the store and when we came out, the Holy Spirit was telling me, go love him, go love him. And I, you know, you know, Jill and I, we were trying to get our food for dinner and get back to the house. And I was like looking at him and I was like, I got all the way to the car. Jill will tell you, my wife will tell you, got all the way to the car, started the car and drove off. And the Holy Spirit was being grieved in me. Oh, no, Stephen, don't drive. No, Steve, go back, go back, go back. And I, st I told my wife, I said, I think the whole, oh, this is funny. I knew that God wanted me to talk to him. But what I said to my wife was, I think the Holy Spirit wants me to go back to talk to him. Because I didn't want to confess to her that I was being so disobedient. It was so clear from the moment we got there that I needed to talk to him. And then when I finally, I drove back around and she was like, okay. And I parked and I got out and, uh, and I walked up to him and I talked to him. Man, our meeting was so blessed. And I told him that God loves him. And I was telling, and this is a guy who was homeless, a young guy named Leon, pray for Leon. He was homeless. 
And I talked to him, and I was telling him that God loved him, and I was ministering to him and all that. It was such a blessing. He had been sitting there for a while, and as I was talking, people were in the grocery store, had already talked to him, and was coming out bringing him bags of groceries. You hear what I'm saying? God was already working in his life, and God was inviting me to join him in the watering of those seeds that were in him. And when I left him and I told him, can I, can I give you a hug? And I hugged him. He said, thank you. Thank you so much. Why? Because I told him that God sees him. But he only can see God through us. And so God had me to not only see him, but to do well done, my good and what? Faithful. Faithful to what? My word. We need to be good by doing God's will. And when you do God's will, it's the best thing you can do. And I will tell you, it's uncomfortable. Look, I'm going to be honest with you, as a pastor, I'm going to tell you, it's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, it's not what you want to do, because you got plans. But you know what? If you're not living for yourself, you will stop yourself and go, wait a minute. Because I was weak in the flesh. I was hungry. I want to get back to the house and eat. But you know what's more important than food? Salvation. Leon coming into the kingdom. Much more important, right? And that's when you stand before God, you want to be able to say, you know what? You may not make every assignment, because I've missed quite a few assignments, to be honest with you. Because we're still battling with this flesh. I'm still battling with my flesh, but I'm being perfected. And more and more, I'm learning to just submit and do God's will, no matter how I feel, whether I don't feel well or tired or hungry, right? But that's when you press through and you press into the things of God and you do God's will. And you sense God's presence in your life that he's pleased with you. And that's what we want. We want God to be pleased with us because we have been bought with a price. The price is his, son, his son's life, his son's life. And he died for us so that we can live for him. Good God Almighty. So there you go. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. And I want to do, as I always do, I want to get into the discussion part of our lesson where we uh, open up to our Rise family that's live here in studio. If you listen to this by recording, we do this every Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we've been meeting for the last three years. It's so powerful. And, and hopefully you've gotten some out of today's message. As I said before, with the Rise, it's not just about you hearing the word of God. It's about you knowing the word of God because that's his will and doing it, and then sharing it. That's why we say take note, because God will reveal a lot to you, and he'll, he'll do a lot through you if you let him do it. And you have some notes to read from. And as you read from it, like today, this is the teaching. If you have the notes, you can study those notes all week long and get that down into your spirit and water those seeds in your spirit so that the enemy, the Bible says that when the word of God comes, the enemy comes right after that. You got to snatch those seeds out. Don't let that happen. Write your notes and take your notes and take it to heart. So praise God. All right, so we'll go ahead and open up for our Arise uh, family to uh, share with us. Uh, what is your thoughts? What did you get out today? What questions do you have? Feel free to share. Unmute yourself and uh, share at this time. Who'd like to go first? All right, I'll go first. It's Loretta. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much for, for this. Um, there are so many things, but one thing stood out. Um, Ephesians 1 verse 5. Um, when Paul was talking to us or in his epistle, talking about um, who we are and, and as you were sharing it, the and the blessings of the redemption and who we are and all. And as you're talking about um, who we are, as we are the righteousness, um, we are the righteous and uh, holy ambassadors. Verse five just sort of stood out. Um, so it sort of gives us the reason why as one of the many reasons. And um, so that is profound because we, we can talk about, you know, if we don't know God, God destined, and he not just, he didn't just select us, but he, as you were saying, even as he was thinking of planning to prepare the earth and recreate earth after the fall of Satan and all and everything, he had us in mind because he wanted us to be a part of his plan. And verse five, it says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. And so when, when, when we read scriptures or verses like this, to imagine that God, God predestined us and when he was thinking about you and I, it gave him great pleasure to know that a point in time would come when we would bow our knees to him. And so when we have this foresight, 
we would be we would be eager to let others know about God's great desire. Because when, when a father gives a child a gift as children, when we had things, let's say Christmas time, we would be we would quickly go and change into our Christmas clothes and go out into the neighborhood because we wanted to show off, uh, you know, like show and tell, show off our shoes, our new sandals, our new hairdos, because it was such a great joy for our friends to see or for us to show and tell what our parents had given to us. And think about it. God was so eager for us to come in because he wants us to become a part of his kingdom and not just for us to come and sit and do nothing. But that through us, everything you have taught us and shared with us today will become manifest in our lives. And that's how the light will be seen in us. Because when we do these things, it's not by our effort. It's not for us to be seen. And that's where in at the end of time, he will be able, we will be able, to, we will hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because the servant does things not of and for himself, but unto the master. So, it, I, you know, like, I'm so excited. Let me stop here. Praise God. I, wanted, I just wanted to share that, you know, what I gleaned. And that verse 5 just jumped up at me. It's amazing how we always read scriptures and every time there's a new rhema to mm, it. So, yes. thank you. <laughs> Praise God. No, thank you. That's powerful. All right, who'd like to go next? Anything that stood out to you? Any questions you might have? Any thoughts? All right, well, we this has been a lot. I mean, this has been, we covered a lot, and, and we always do. Um, my hope is that, you know, as we go through the scripture, God reveals to you something specific for you, that the word of God comes alive in you, um, and that you can hear God's voice. A lot of people say, I don't hear God. You hear from God, I don't hear God. Well, God's voice is his word. And if you read his word, you can hear his voice. The more you read it, the more you see him reaching out to you, loving you. This, this whole thing, the, the Bible, all 66 books from Genesis to, X, to uh, Revelation is God's love letter to you to bring you back to him. And this is the most beautiful thing. It's 40 writers over 400 years wrote these 66 books. and it's all for you. If there was only one person that would come to know him on this earth after Adam, and it was you, he would have done all of that. Christ would have died for you and all of this would have happened just for you. And the, the, the other thing too, is you got to understand this, that God, because you were, were in him from the beginning, he has a plan for you beyond this life. And that's the joy that I have. That Jesus said, in this life, you will have tribulation. There's trouble in this world because there's sin in this world. But be of good courage, I have overcome this world. Jesus is telling you that I've come, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So it's not just this life you need to look at. It's the life that is to come. It's the life that once this body and this flesh dies, we get a glorified body. And that glorified body, we inherit with that glorified body, we inherit the kingdom of heaven. And once God does away with, with the devil and the false prophet um, and, and, and all of the, the sin that's in the world and he gets rid of death, there will be no more death, dying, crying, pain, hurt. And you'll be in a glorified body that will last for all eternity the way he intended for Adam and Eve to live for all eternity with him in a fellowship with him. And that's a glorious time. And so live this life, absolutely, but live this life for the next. And you should look at it like boot camp. This life is like boot camp and training for the next. Through this life, you can learn who God is and God is giving us time. Of course, God is outside of time. He's in eternity. But as long as you're alive each day, just be better than you were the day before. And that should give you some encouragement. You don't have to be perfect, but have a desire to be perfected in Christ and be better than you were the day before. Think better, speak better, react better, have a better motive, better actions. And if you fall, which we all do, all have sinned and come short, fall short of the glory of God. If you fall and you sin, then allow that moment to, to humble you, repent and go back to God. Don't be like Adam and Eve who sinned and ran and hid their bodies and themselves from God. Don't be like that. Run to the throne of grace where there's mercy and forgiveness and ask God to forgive you. He says he is willing to forgive you 
of all your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that's a beautiful thing because he knows that we're, we're still dealing with our flesh. And as we're being perfected, and Paul said this, Paul said that he is the chief sinner. This is the apostle Paul who wrote more than half of the New Testament. More than half of the New Testament books were written by Paul. Okay. And he said, I'm the chief sinner. Why? Because he was dealing with his, his body also. Matter of fact, he says, who would deliver me from this body of sin and death? He knew what he was dealing with, the same thing we're dealing with. So don't, when you fall, don't let the devil say, oh, you're down now. You might as well just keep going. You messed up. You're not perfect. You don't have a, a A plus, 100 score. You, you done messed up. No, don't listen to that. You can always go to God. Why? Because Jesus' blood is, uh, is the redeeming blood. And because of his blood is on our lives, because he loves us so much, he died for us, we can live for him and we can be restored. We just have to get, get, get back up and get back in again. All right, before we end, and we're going to end uh, right here, does anyone have any final thoughts or takeaway? All right, the Masons. Hey, Pastor, Pastor Steve, I just wanted to say in, in verse 6, it talks about we praise him. Mm. You know, we give him glory. And uh, uh, that's something that we need to do as Christians because he's poured out so much favor and mercy upon us. Yes. Like you said, we, we fail, we fail. We fall short of God every day, mm -hmm. but uh, he is always faithful and he's given us the best. He sprinkled his, poured out his love on us on every day, whether yes. we have a good one or a bad. And I'm, I'm just so thankful that we should be praising him every day, every moment we get a chance to. Amen. Just to lift his name up. Yeah, There's nothing like being thankful. You know, you, you just, um, you got to see yourself in the state that you're in. If you were, if you were uh, at sea and your boat was sinking and you was on a on a float on on a piece of wood and you needed to be saved, if Jesus Christ came by Himself and lifted you out of that water, would you be thankful? Yeah, you would absolutely praise Him. You would know that God is God and that He is to be praised. Um, and so, so understanding where you came from, where He found you, and who you used to be, and and what He's done in your life understanding the sin that he's delivered you from and how you're not who you used to be, you're not what you used to do. God doesn't judge you from your past sins because you've been redeemed from that. Then you can truly give him praise and glory. And that's what Pastor Wayne was talking about. Praise God. Yeah. And that uh, Christ is the firm foundation. And the Bible says all other else is sinking sand. Mm. So that's I got to right. praise him. That's right. Yeah. We can stand on him. In fact, when Pastor Wayne prayed at the beginning, he broke out in the song because he was his heart was filled with praise. <laughs> and we love that. Thank you, brother. All right. Karen, good morning. Good morning. Sorry to be late. No, um, you're fine. Um, I just wanted to say kudos to what Wayne just said because um that's that's exactly what I was feeling during the whole um lesson today. Um been a uh been a rough couple couple of months <laughs> and but at the same time I feel like I've come through it through God better mm. and um through his blessings that I receive daily even though things seem to be hard I can see his blessings in the little things and I just praise him all day Let's praise God and that's what we got to do you're right it's a lot of times as things are hard, but you know it's worth it. Yeah, doesn't feel like it at the time, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Be honest about it. So, so now, what's the lesson that you learned in terms of pressing through 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 times of trial? Oh gosh, um, oh, through the surrender class, I'm learning to surrender things um, that I haven't been able to do before, and through the surrendering process i learned that i receive more blessings and i'm more at peace um but i also found out on my way home yesterday that i'm i've still got a little bit of a temper and i lose it every once in a while um so i had look, to look, and the bible said be angry but sin not so so you can't get angry it's nothing wrong with getting angry i mean getting oh. angry I was that nice to somebody and, and it was, it was uncalled for. I mean, oh, I mean okay. so you had to repent. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I had to, I had to humble myself pretty, pretty deeply, but, um, 
not as worse as other times, but it, it was uncalled for. And I know that, but it, you know, like I, it, it was just, um, it was a lesson. It was mm. a lesson. And a lot of the things you said were the, 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 the Bible verses, uh, pointed it out to me. It mm. came, it came full force this morning. I had forgotten it until the word showed me I needed to remember and repent of what I had done. So I mm. did. So. Yeah, that's okay. I'm glad you're transparent and honest with us about that um, because we all have our own struggle. Um, and in those moments that lets us know where we are. Right. Um, mm. In fact, something, something I teach my family is the halt principle, H A L T the halt pr principle with the halt means to stop. Actually it means to stop abruptly. Um, halt means it's an acronym and it tells us when not to make a decision, when not to give a reaction. So there's four states of being in halt. You shouldn't give a reaction or response when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Whenever you are in one of those states or if you are in multiple, multiple states, more than one, you have to really maintain control of yourself. You have to have uh, it's, it's called uh, not being accidental, but being intentional. You have to be very intentional watching yourself. Okay, man, I'm tired and I'm hungry. Okay, wait a minute. So when people come to you and things happen, you have to say, okay, wait a minute, give me a moment. It's not a good time. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I get back to you? Or the phone rings and somebody's talking and you're like, you know what? I'm going to have to call you back and just hang up. Because right. you know that it, it'll just take them a very little bit, push a button, and then you just want to give that, you know, whether it's misplaced aggression or just anger that'll happen. But being conscious of the fact of these four states, if I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, I have to be careful what I say and what I do in this moment, because you should never let the moment define your destiny. Because once you say a word, it's like an arrow. You can't get it back. Right. Uh, once you give an action, you can't take it back. It's an action, right? Uh, right? And this thing about the fruit of the spirit, when you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So in those moments, when especially when you know you're in one of those states, that's when you got to start putting on some Christian music, blasting it around you. You start praying in, in English, praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. You got to do whatever you got to do to edify yourself and get you back to the right standing with God. Even if you have to separate yourself from everybody, park on the side of the road and go for a walk or something, just wait a minute. I'm in the wrong place, you know, and everybody deals with that. Not just you, but everybody. But you remind me of something. I'm glad you did. Of course, God is using you as he always does. Uh, Karen is blessed and highly favored. Let me pull this up and we'll end right here. We end on this Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight, verses 18 to 23. Let's take a look at that. Uh, Karen, if you could read just verse 18 for me. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory, which shall be revealed in us. All right. Now that's King James. And let me do the parallel and I'm going to pull up this time. I'm going to pull up the amplifier. Let's look at the Amplified Version. Amplified Version, go to the top. And I want you to read it in the Amplified. Uh, for I consider from the standpoint of faith that the sufferings of the present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us. Look at uh, that. Yeah, okay. And yeah. that's the thing. We we are definitely suffering in this present present life. But you know what? Our suffering is not even worthy to be compared to the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us. What does that mean? That God is revealing himself to us by his spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh. He's revealing his word to us in our minds. And, and let this mind be in you that's also in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he will renew your mind that your life be transformed. He's doing that, doing that to us. And in us, he transformed us from the inside, which means we got some, some things he's fixing, you know, and that's the whole point about this walk in Christ is by faith. But faith without works is dead. We got to work. It's a work that needs to be done. But the good thing is that we're not on our own because he, the word of God says, he that had begun a good work in us is him that is performing. it. So we are in partnership with him and we allow him to work on us and in us so that we can become not bitter, but better. We can we can challenge our old ways of doing things because, you know, in Christ, it says old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new because we're a new creation in Christ. And, and day by day, we start to understand, okay, that's an area I need to fix. I stop right there. But you know what? That's the area I need to fix. Or 
something happens and you used to respond one way and now you respond different. You go, wow, man, I have grown. God is God is maturing me. This is beautiful. You see your growth. That happened too. <laughs> okay, go ahead, share. Uh, I've been really, really angry with my mother. Really, really angry. Mm -hmm. And when I left um, them yesterday in Hampton to come home, I actually was overwhelmed with a loving feeling for her. And I have not had that in a very long time. So that's, anyway, <laughs> to me, that was big. Hello. Are you still there? Hello. He muted again for some reason. Oh, dang. Is, is, is Professor Sue still there? Oh, there you go. Yeah, I I muted as well. So, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so I was saying, Karen, how did you transition from, from uh, anger to love? Through everything I've been doing through the word with the like the surrender, the surrender group has been huge. It's about biblically based and um it just helped me to not only forgive myself, but forgive, forgive her. Mm. Uh, through the forgiveness, um I was able to feel that again. So that's good. Yeah. That's good. So that's the thing about forgiveness. God wants us to forgive others so that we ourselves can be forgiven. In fact, if you don't forgive other people, God says he's not going to forgive you. So you should know that. Uh, but if you forgive others, God will also forgive you. Now check this out. When you forgive others, it's not that they have apologized. It's not like they're remorseful. It's not like they've been made right. They are wrong, but yet we still forgive them. Why? Because in forgiving others, you don't free them. You end up freeing yourself. And that's a beautiful thing, because once you truly forgive a person, because they, they've done something wrong to you, whether they said something wrong or did something wrong, when you truly forgive them, you say, you know what? In fact, uh, Stephen in the Bible, he was stoned to death. And he and while he was being stoned, he said, count not this sin against them. I was thinking about that this week. And I was thinking, you know, that has to be God in you, to be being killed and in the midst of dying, saying, don't hold this sin against them. Forgive them. And it is it's just in that moment that we see Christ, because that's what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus died for those who were nailing him to the cross. Jesus died for those who were mocking him on the cross. Jesus died for those who hated him. Jesus died for the world. And so in that, the same thing, we and we don't have that burden, that same burden. We're not being publicly humiliated and tortured and hung up on the cross. But at the same time, Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. Follow me what? Follow my example. And that's in doing exactly what Karen said, taking a moment to allow God to help you to surrender. And when you surrender, and I love that song, I surrender all. All to thee I surrender. All to thee I freely give. And that's the thing. God wants it to be an act of our will to come before him and go, you know, Father, I know I've been here, And you've forgiven me. And so I'm going to give that same forgiveness to everyone else, that agape love. That 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 um, that unconditional love is not that they deserve it. It's not like they did anything that fixed this problem. But you know what? Don't count this sin against them, Lord. I forgive them. I love them. And and while we are while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that means while they are yet sinner, sinning in our life, we die to ourselves. We die to ourselves in our own will, and we say, God, no, Your will be done. Your will be done. And, and to be honest with you, if you can see them like God sees them, you know that they're only doing it because of sin. The reason why they hurt people hurt people is because of sin. And if you realize that, it's like it's not personal. This is just 
the reality of this world. And if you can love them through those moments, you might be able to be used to save their soul. God might even be able to use you because they'll say to you one day, as mean as I was to you, you were always nice to me. And that's a big reason why I repented. In fact, it says that when you bless your enemy, it's like heaping hot coals on their heads because they know that you don't like them. They know that they don't like you, but yet you still won't be nice to them and love them. That only could be God. And that's when they see God and glorify him. Uh, and that God can use that to win them to himself. So praise God. All right. Karen, do you have anything else? No, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm, no, no, you're fine. I just saw that you unmuted. I, um, I was, I just didn't mute. So I'll be <laughs> okay. It's all good. It's all good. So we know that we are God's children. We know that God loves us. We learned that in episode two. Um, and then we also know that because God loves us, he's also made us to be something very special and something unique. There's a reason why we are here. And while we are here is to bring him glory, to give him our life and say, you know what? Your will be done, Father. You will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as a joint heir with Christ, we become what he wants us to be. And what does he want us to be? And that's what we learned today. We want to be the righteousness of God in Christ. We want to be his holy ambassador. We want to be his holy ambassadors. In and so I want to encourage you to know that that is who you are. That's who Christ came to die so that you could be. That's who God ordained for you to be before the very foundation of the world. He chose you and he has called you to be an ambassador for him. Righteous. That means being right in all that you do in your mind, body and spirit. And as you do that, you bring him glory. Praise God. All right. So does anyone have anything else before we close? I'll go ahead and close with that in prayer for tonight. Does anybody have anything else? All right. Praise God. Well, I'll go ahead and close this in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you that you says where two or three are gathered in my name, there you are in the midst. And so we thank you for your presence, Lord, today, as we've studied your word. We thank you uh, for revealing yourself to us through your word. Father, we just give you glory as your children that you have brought us together in this time. There's so many things that we could be doing today, right now, and every Saturday. Uh, but you have brought us together in this time that we can learn your word and understand your will and know who we are in you. And so according to your word, Father, we are your ambassadors. We are adopted into your family. We are your children. You are the father of light. And we are the children of light. Help us to shine and reflect the light of your glory into the world. That those who are hurting, those who are helpless, those who are in pain, those who are in need of salvation, and redemption, those who are in need of deliverance, Lord, might be able to speak to us and hear your voice. Father, I pray that all those who are listening uh, and watching this video, Lord, those who are uh, joining with us here on Arise, Father, that you would uh, bless them with the extra spiritual blessing, Father, that they might know their inheritance as ambassadors and walk in the purpose and power for which you called them to. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we do not live our life for ourselves. We live our life for Christ. Continue to use us and help us, Lord, to each day be better than we were the day before. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise for all that you're doing on the earth. Our prayer is that your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven, as you have already preordained before all of this was even created, your will is done. That's why we have the book, Genesis, all the way to Revelation, because the, you, you already set the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And so we thank you that we know that we are your children and your family. We give you glory for it. We thank you for every person that's listening to this, that supports us, that helps us to do your will in the earth. Those that are your children, Lord, continue to give us strength, power, and revelation and wisdom according to your will. In Jesus' name, that we might do your will on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Well, hallelujah. Glory to God. I thank God for each of y'all. And of course, we continue to pray for you guys. Uh, we continue to pray for all those who support us. We thank you for your financial support. We thank you for your prayers. We thank you for um, all that you're doing as you spread the word about the Arise Bible Study. Continue to invite others to come. All you can do is send out the invitation. Send it out and uh, let people know ahead of time that you're going to let them know on Saturday when we're meeting and send them the link. And ask them to come and join us. And uh, it may be the very seeds that are planted and watered in their life that can give them the answer they need for the season that they're in. So God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. If you need me, reach out to me. You have my number. And uh, I'll see you on the next uh, episode. God bless. Have a good one, everybody.